Okay, so um, hello everyone. My name is Konrad Kaminski. I work at Allegro, which is the largest Polish e-commerce company. And today we're going to see how we can write asynchronous code with proteins in Kotlin. So how many of you actually used or know Kotlin? That's quite a few, great. How about Java? Okay, that's fine. Um, I ask because there will be some code shown here, actually quite a lot of code, and it will be useful to know something about Kotlin, but Java is enough. I will not use some um, strange syntax of, of Kotlin. So if you're familiar with Java, you should understand also this kind of code. So, okay, yeah, right. So let's have a look at this simple code. It's, it's simple because um, there are only three lines which execute um, in sequence. So we have a method that first retrieves some uh, value of an account ID of a user, and then it asks uh, with a second method about how many products that account has, and then it sends some information about this account uh, and the user and this account, this product account, to some other service. So the code is it's quite straightforward, it's quite simple. But let's imagine that all those three methods, the get user account ID, get product account, and send message, they all, uh, when they execute, they do something with a network. So for example, they access an external endpoint, or they access a database server, which usually means that they also go over a net network. So what happens with an application which uses this kind of code? Well, the, the problem with this code in this situation is that the thread that executes this code will block for some time because it waits for the, for the response from the server. So essentially, we have a, a thread which does nothing, but it consumes some resources. So things like memory for stack, or a CPU, because the threads have to be handled. There is an OS scheduler for threads, and um, so it takes quite some time to handle all those threads. And if, if you have multiple threads, then context switches between threads also takes quite some time. So if you have like a thousand threads, or 10,000 th threads maybe, on, on contemporary machines, it's not that a big deal. But um, nowadays, we live in a world where we have to concurrently, um, concurrently serve like a million users or, or tens of millions of users. And if we were to have a million of threads, then essentially probably no server on the market exists or it's a very expensive machine which, which could handle that many threads. And also, it's quite inefficient. So, we have to deal somewhat, somehow with the situation. So the, the, the most um, common way to do it is to have some form of asynchronous programming. And there's a couple of ways we can do asynchronous programming. So the first one, it's quite straightforward. So we use callbacks. So with callbacks, um, instead of having our methods return a value, we pass an additional parameter, a callback, to that method. And that callback is called when the result is available. So in our, in our example here, all of the three methods, get user account ID, get product account, and, get, and send message, they all have callbacks. Here, is, it's a very simple um, form of a callback because it's like just a function. So here we... Um, assume that no exception is being thrown from these um, functions. And, um, but still, if you, if you look at the code that we now have, the code of, se of the send audit message method, the code is more complex than the one that we've seen before because of those callbacks. And what you actually get is something which is called callback hell. So essentially, every time we call a method, and that method calls, uh, and after that we call another method, etc. Uh, we have to use another callback, and this code actually it's pretty much um, it's pretty simple, 
because there, is no thi there are no things like if conditions, like exception handling, like for loops or while loops, and still we have this kind of code which is not as readable and not really as maintainable as the one that we've seen before. So that's one way to go. This has been actually used quite a lot in the JavaScript world where you had functions as callbacks. Um, so um, there, is, there are better ways to do it. So one of the better ways is to use some kind of a, whoa, what was it? Okay, uh, is to use some kind of a um, promise object. So a promise object, with promise objects, our functions no longer take a callback as a parameter, but they return a, an object where you can, um, when, where there is a promise that the value will be returned um, at some point in time, and then we can react somehow uh, when that value is delivered. So here I use a promise, uh, a promise object which is a completable future. That's a standard type in Java. And um, now our code looks a bit better than the one with callbacks. But the problem with this kind of code is that on, on a promise object, we have to have different kinds of methods, we call them combinators, um, to be used in certain situations. So for example, here we have two different combinators. One, which is called when we want to react to a value, which is uh, a return value from the um, get uh, user account ID method. And the other one is when uh, is the code with, that reacts to the, the call to the get product count. And there is like a number of those combinators. So every promise, every kind of promise object of, of promise type comes with the, its own set of those combinators. So nowadays, um, Rx Java or generally reactive libraries are, qui are quite popular and they all come with these kinds of combinators which are different. Well, they overlap um, to some extent, but most of them uh, are different than the ones on Compatible Future. And furthermore, now we have to write our code in a functional way. So um, the code, it's not as easy to write and not as intuitive as the one that we've seen uh, at the beginning. So this is why in Kotlin, in version 1.1, there's a new concept uh, introduced, which is, oh, it's not working, okay, which is coroutines. And um, the concept itself, it's not new. So it's been around for at least 50 years. It was introduced in the similar language. Um, and um, in Kotlin, the way to write coroutines is to use suspending functions. So here we have the same code that we've seen before, but this code is asynchronous, and it uses suspending functions to um, introduce this asynchronicity. So what's a suspending function? So a suspending function is a function that can suspend at suspension points. So there are certain points in your function where a function can suspend. So here, every time we call get user account ID or get product count or send message, the, our, our method, our suspending function can suspend because they all are suspending functions. And when I say a suspending function or when I say that it suspends, I, I don't mean that it will block the, the thread because the, the thread is not blocked. I mean, this is why we introduce it, so that we introduce such um, asynchronous code so that our threads will not be blocked. So how is it actually um, achieved? Um, so we're going to have a, a bit um, a look under the hood of how suspending functions work in Kotlin. So OK, maybe I'll just uh, use the keyboard. Uh, OK, so here we have the, our suspending function. And if you look at the code generated by the compiler, then you can see that our suspending function that we write actually has a different signature in the compiled code, because it now has an additional parameter of type continuation. 
and it also returns an any with a question mark, which uh, means that actually it can return any value, any object, even a null value. So why is, why is it like that? So the, the contract for the suspending function is this. If a suspending function does not suspend its execution, so it just does something and, and wants to return a value, then it just does something and returns a value, because there is this any object returned. Um, it can be returned as an any object, any type. Then it's, it's, um, it's possible to return simply a value. But if a suspending function suspends its execution, then there is a special value returned. There's a special constant defined in Kotlin. And the true value will be returned via this continuation object. And the continuation is actually this interface. It's actually some form of a callback. So it has two methods, resume and resume with exception. And either of them will be called at some point in time with the return value of our method or with an exception if our method wants to throw an exception. So we can see here that it's actually very similar to what we've seen with the callbacks. But we can write our code uh, in, in a direct style. We don't have to use callbacks explicitly. They're created by the compiler implicitly when you compile your suspending functions. So let's have a look, a look at um, some simple code that uh, was generated by the compiler. It's actually not precisely the same kind of code. I've, I simplified it a bit, but uh, we can focus on the most important things here. So here we can see that we have our um, send audit message, which is a, which was a, is a suspending function, and what it does is it creates an object which is a state machine. So our our suspending functions, which calls first one method, then the other, then the other one, it's converted into a state machine where an object like this, the send audit message object, will keep the state, meaning where we are in the execution of our method. And um, because, um, because, as I told you, if the method suspends its execution, it has to return a special value, we return this special value here. So when we create the state machine, we, pass, we have to pass an initial state. And our initial state here is, first of all, the parameters of the method itself. So the parameters are user ID and the callback that we should call when our method finishes, so when our state machine um, goes to the final state. Um, the other things that are in our state machines is the state itself, meaning in, in what sort of, to put it simply, in what line of code, or in what um, the point in code we are right now during the execution of our method. And this is label. So initially label is zero, which means that we just started executing our function. We also have fields for, for all those local fields in our methods. So um, before we've seen in the code that our methods return first the account ID, then the product count, so we have to store it also um, as, as part of this state machine. And one thing, one more thing that we can see here also is that our um, our state machine, our send audit message object, it implements the continuation interface, and this is because we can uh, we've seen that the the suspending function has this continuation interface as the last parameter. So by doing this, um, let's say trick with uh, with the fact that our state machine implements continuation interface we can reuse the same object for all calls to these suspending functions. We're going to see it in a moment. So we have our resume method. And the resume method is, will be called every time um, a suspending function, which, we, which is uh, executed inside our send audit message, every time it returns a value. So first, it's called, 
uh, with the initial state. The initial state was zero. We call it resume. We actually call it in our send audit message function with the null value. And what happens here is we can see that we are in the beginning of the execution of our suspending function. So we say, OK, the next state is one. And we call the first method that was inside the body of the send audit message. So it's get user account ID. And we pass, as, as the continuation object, we pass ourselves so that when the get user account ID method um, returns a value, it will call the resume method on the same object. So this is the first line of our, of our method. Um, in the second line, we do almost the same thing. So first, we take the result of the get user account method. The result is passed as a, as a parameter of the resume, because this is the, the con contract for the continuation interface. And then we set the, st the state to be 2, so that the next time this resume will be called, will resume from the next line of the code. And then we call get product count. And by the same token, we also call um, send message. We just send, send message. We pass ourselves as the callback. And at the end, we call resume on the original callback, so that if uh, someone who called send audit message will be notified that the send audit message finished its, its execution. So all this magic is actually done by the compiler. Um, it's quite evol involved, but it works in every single case. So you don't have to think about, you know, that if it works with exceptions or for loops, etc. All the constructs of the Kotlin language are supported. So but th this is quite quite um, an achievement. So uh, this kind of code is generated from this kind of code. So we, we can we, we only write this kind of code and it's get generated automatically by the compiler. Um, so, but you know, um, at some point we have to write our own suspending functions and and have access to this callback parameter because. This is like an, an abstractions. We can use different functions, but at some point we have to have access to this callback so that we can introduce our own um, our own behavior. So, that for example, um, if a method is called, we want uh, this method to be executed executed on some other thread, um, and from that thread call the resume method. So, how can we do that? So, for that we're going to we're going to use basic building blocks um, for coroutines. And one of them is the suspend coroutine function. So it's a regular function from Kotlin language. And it takes a single parameter, which is a callback. And uh, in that callback, we can call the resume method on the callback or the resume exception method. Um, but usually we do it in a different thread, so we don't do it directly here. We just, in, for example, can create a separate thread, and in that thread, for example, fetch something from a network and then call resume. So um, I'm going to show you a simple function that uses the suspend coroutine. Actually, I'm going to write it uh, so that you can get more, um, uh, you can feel it better. So I'm going to write a is it visible? OK. So I'm going to write a, a version of a sleep method. So a sleep method in Java it just um, blocks a thread for some time, and then the, the code can continue. The thread can continue its execution. So we're going to write a, a version of sleep, but it will be a suspending function. So it will not block the thread. It will suspend the function for some time. So let's call this function my sleep. And let's, uh, it will take a single parameter, which is for how, how, how much uh, time are we going to sleep. Uh, it's going to return unit, which is like a void in Java. Um, and it's going to use the suspend coating that we've just seen. So suspend coating takes a callback as a parameter. So there's a number of ways to actually implement this kind of method. What I'm going to use is to use 
the, the timer object, which is uh, available in the standard Java library, um, which allows you to schedule some tasks and um, specify at what time should, uh, they should be run. So I'm going to do a timer. Um. OK, that the true parameter means that the, the timer will use a daemon threads so that when the JVM exits or when the main method of, the, of our application um, uh, finishes its execution, then the JVM will just um, uh, stop working. So let's call it my timer. And uh, so here we're going to schedule a task. And OK. And in that task, we're going to call resume on our callback. So now we have a fully working version of a sleep method, of a sleep function, um, which is a suspending function. So we don't have uh, any thread blocked here. And because the timer here uses a single, th I mean the, the implementation of the timer actually uses a single thread for all scheduled tasks. So we don't create additional threads. We don't block additional threads. There's a single thread which will handle all sleeps or all calls of this um, my sleep. So we're going to use this method in a while. But um, I want to show you one more thing before we, uh, we continue. So we've seen how we can write our own suspending functions with this kind of uh, basic building block. But suspending functions can only be called from within other suspending functions or suspending lambdas. They can't be called from regular code. And this is because there is this additional continuation parameter which has to be passed somehow. Um, but there must be some way to actually invoke a, a suspending function uh, from regular code, because otherwise it wouldn't really make sense. So um, we can actually use a few methods. They are called code in builders. So there's a couple of them. So the first one is launch. So launch is a function which takes a suspending lambda as a parameter. So a suspending lambda is like a, a suspending function uh, is, is, um, uh, is something where we can um, invoke suspending functions. And launch, uh, it returns a job. So basically, it just runs the code that's inside this lambda on some thread. You can specify actually what thread is going to be used or actually what context is going to be used. And that context actually defines what threads are being used. And, but by default, it, it will use some default context, which on JVM is going to be a common pool, which is like a fork join pool. If you've done any concurrent programming um, on JVM, then um, this may be familiar to you. But essentially, we just call launch. This will execute or start executing the, the suspending lambda on some thread. And we'll get a job object. So a job is something which controls the life cycle of, um, uh, of this code that, that is um, created and started by launch. And there is a couple of methods there defined, which we can use. Uh, the most important one that we're going to use uh, today is join which waits for the suspending lambda to finish its execution. And, but still, um, uh, and, and the other, sus the other um, code in uh, builder that we're going to use is run blocking. So run blocking is very similar to join, but it waits until the suspending lambda that's passed as a parameter until it finishes its execution. So we don't have um, a job as a result. We have the result of the suspending lambda as, a, as the result of run blocking. Um, it's run blocking is it's rarely used in your production code. It's mainly used for demo code or for things like um, unit tests. Uh, but you're going to use run blocking in our code. So let's try to apply those code in builders to our code with our MySleep um, function. Okay, 
Um, so let's have our main method, and in our main method, let, let's launch um, a suspending function, which we'll call my sleep for, let's say, 500 milliseconds, and then it will print um, a dot. So it's quite simple. After, after half a second, it should print a dot, and that's, that's it. So it, doesn't, it hasn't done anything. Um, this is because launch, OK, let me scroll that a bit. Um, launch, it launched this, the execution of this lambda in some separate thread. And then our main method finished its execution. And since every thread in our JVM is a daemon thread, it means that the JVM will just stop. So we have to do something uh, so that the JVM will not exit before this, uh, this launch or whatever is inside this launch uh, finishes its execution. And there's a couple of ways to do it. We can simply um, sleep here. So we'll sleep for um, uh, one second. Um, so it should be enough for the suspending, co suspending lambda to be executed. And we can see here that it actually works. But that, that's not an elegant solution. So we're going to use the join function that we've seen before. So our launch returns a job. And we're going to join a job. So it should wait until the, uh, this dot is, is printed. But join is a suspending function, so it can actually be re executed only or can be called from within another suspending lambda suspending function. So we're going to use the run blocking um, code in builder that we've seen before. Um, yeah. So this time it should print a dot and then exit the JVM. Um, so here we've just, uh, we now know all those things that are um, needed to use suspending functions, to write suspending functions, to invoke suspending functions. And um, one more thing which I want to show you is coatings are sometimes called lightweight threads. They are called li lightweight threads because there is, there is some point of view from which you can look at them uh, and see that they are actually threads. And to show you that, I'm going to create here we have just one coroutine because we launch only one, one, um, one coroutine, one suspending lambda is used. So let's, uh, for example, let's uh, create 100,000 uh, coroutines, 100,000 suspending lambdas and run it and let's see if it works. So to create 100,000 such things, um, we can create a list of 100,000 jobs. Uh, it's called jobs. So jobs is now a list of a job. So it should hold 100,000 jobs. And then um, for each job, we can wait until it finishes. Um, join. And let's print something after that. OK. So let's see how long will it take. Right, so about a second or so. So we've just launched 100,000 um, coatings, each one waiting for half a second, and then printing a dot. And you can see that it worked perfectly without any problem. Now, let's try to do the same thing with threads. Um, actually, the, the, we can just you know, change the code so that it, it's, 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 it's um, the changes are, are, are really uh, small. So we're going to use thread. We're going to use sleep because we, we can't use suspending functions in, in, in regular code. And we can use join because we also have a join method on the thread which does almost the same thing as the join on the job. And that's probably it. So let's try to execute it. Right. So I'm not going to count those dots, but uh, it's roughly about 2,000 dots were, were printed, and then we got out of memory error. And this is because each thread, as I told, uh, as I said in the beginning, 
each thread consumes memory. It's mainly for the stack and some OS structures. Um, so with default memory settings on my machine, it's just able to create a, over a thousand um, threads. So it's, it's far from the 100,000 um, coatings that we can use here. So you can see that um, now our applications can be more scalable because um, they don't consume that many resources. Now, um, what we've seen so far is a sequential code. So we, we um, invoke one function, then the other one, then the other one. But coroutines can also be used for um, concurrent programming. And for that, there's a coroutine builder uh, called async. So async is a function which also takes a suspending lambda as a parameter. I mean, nearly all coroutine builders take a suspending lambda as a parameter. But this, um, this uh, suspending fun this async function retains a deferred value. And deferred is actually sort of a promise object, but it's, um, it's a native Kotlin type. Uh, so uh, the, the, the language designers uh, didn't really know uh, what kind of a type, promise type to use here, uh, and deferred was the one of the, the names that was um, available, so they used deferred. And um, so let's try to see how this async works. Um, let's try to write a code which, can, which does something in parallel. So let's suppose we have a suspending function which loads some details about the user. Let's, let's, let's suppose we want some personal details. Um. So I'm going to return some details. It doesn't really matter uh, what the class will hold. Um, and let's delay for two seconds. So actually, there is a, 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 a sort of a sleep. That we've written the mysleep method. There is already a built-in uh, method called delay, which actually does the same thing in a bit different way. Uh, but essentially, the contract is the same. It just suspends the execution of the, of the function for some time. And then le let's return these um, personal details. And let's have a second method, which is very similar to the first one. But we're going to return the financial details. Um. And now let's combine those methods so that we want to load the details and uh, these details will contain both financial and personal details. So we're going to use a, a, a f third um, method. Um, okay, and it will return a pair of per okay, and financial details. So we're going to first fetch the personal deta details. Um, OK. Then financial details um, here. And then we'll just return uh, the pair, personal to financial. OK, so now we have our method, which combines the calls to both methods uh, in sequence for now. And let's call this method. Now, we're going to measure the time that's needed to execute uh, this method. And for this, we're going to use a very convenient method, in, which is available in Kotlin, which is called measure time millis, where you can just um, call a method. We're going to assign it to a variable and just uh, print this time. And of course, it's a suspending function, so we have to use run blocking. OK, so that should be pretty much it. So we're going <coughs> to invoke two methods in sequence. And each method should take roughly two seconds because of the delays that we've introduced. And we see here that the total time is four seconds. 
So now let's convert this code into the one that uses the async coroutine builder so that we can run them in parallel. So it's quite simple to do it. We can put async here. Okay. But now our personal and financial variables are of type deferred. So we have to somehow get the value from the deferred um, object. And to, use, to, to get it, we're going to use await um, function. So await is a suspending function on a deferred, which waits for this value or suspends the execution, uh, waiting for this, uh, for this um, result to be available, and then continues uh, the execution. So we're going to use await here and await here. And that's actually all we have to do. So let's see how it works now. Right. So now it took about two seconds. So you can see that it, it works. It, it does it in, in parallel. And uh, in this way, we can write our, co our concurrent code. And, but we have to do it explicitly. So this, the, the asynchronous code that we've written before uh, the, the sequential one with, the, with those callbacks which were hidden, which were implicit, it, it used um, this asynchronicity implicitly. We, we, you, you can't really see that it's an asynchronous code. It's all taken care of by the compiler. Here we have to do it explicitly. We have to tell what kind of methods are, uh, we want to call in parallel. And this is because the language designers they decided that it's more common to actually uh, have a, an application where you have a sequence of, of things to do and each of those things is asynchronous than the concurrent code. Um, so let's get back to our um, presentation. So there's one more thing which I want to show you, and this is yet another coroutine builder, which is called Build, build Sequence. So a sequence in Kotlin is something like, it's sort of a collection, like a lazy collection. So um, every time you want some value from that collection, like, it's like a stream of values. Every time you want the next value from that stream of values, um, you can, pro for example, provide a function which will provide you with this, uh, with this value. So this way you can, for example, have an infinite collection of values. And um, let's suppose that you want to have a sequence of values from the Fibonacci sequence. So a Fibonacci sequence is a sequence of values where uh, a, a value is the sum of the last two values of those sequence, and the first two values in the Fibonacci sequence is one and one. So it goes like one and one, and then the, the next value is one plus one, which, which means two. The next value is one plus two, which is three. And the next one is 2 plus 3, which is 5, etc. So it's, it's quite complex to actually write a function which generates a Fibonacci, an nth Fibonacci number. Um, but it's quite easy to do it with um, coroutines. So build sequence, in build sequence, you provide a suspending lambda. And this, this suspending lambda will just execute and it will suspend when you call the yield a function. A yield is a suspending function, and it means that you provide a value of, of a sequence here. So in, in this code, you can see that first we provide the value 1, which is the first value in the Fibonacci sequence, and then we, we, called, we hold the values of the last two um, of the last two values in the Fibonacci sequence, which are, which are called A and B here. So we, uh, we calculate the sum of these values, and then we deliver the next one, the next value, and etc. Et so we have like an infinite loop here. So one might be, um, one might ask, like, no, we have an infinite loop here, so we're gonna just, you know, make the CPU really hot. But it's not, it's, it's, it will not um, make the CPU hot, because here we suspend the function, the yield, um, function is a suspending function. 
So it will suspend the execution of this, uh, of this coroutine. Um, and this way, um, we can, with sequential code, we just generate some values. We can create a sequence which then later can be, um, can be used and we can access it like a normal sequence. So that's about everything I wanted to cover here. <laughs> And there are some things which are not covered here. I'm actually, there are lot of, lots of things which are not covered here, um, which are quite important, uh, but um, there's really no time for, this, for it. So one of the most important things is code in context, which is um, something which defines how the code in is executed. So we can, for example, specify what threads are used um, uh, to execute those, uh, the, those um, coroutines with coroutine context. We have mutexes, which is sort of like with concurrent coding, uh, which you write using threads, you have those synchronization primitives where you can say that, OK, this, pipe ca ca this part of code should be run only by a single thread, and no other thread should actually run, uh, should execute um, the same code at the same time. With um, coroutines, we can use mutexes. Uh, which have those lock and unlock methods which are suspending functions. So the, our, our suspending functions will just suspend for, this, uh, for, the, for the time that the mutex is, is used by someone else. We also have channels and actors. So if you used Go, for example, the Go language has this notion of channels where coroutines, because there are coroutines in, in, in Go as well. The, the, the implementation is a bit different, but uh, the concept of channels is similar here to what it is in Go. So essentially, coroutines communicate between themselves by sending the values over channels and, and, um, and uh, waiting for them. And there are lots of libraries which allow you to write a code with uh, suspending functions and interoperate uh, with some existing libraries. So for example, we, we have libraries for Rx Java, we have libraries for Guava, we have libraries which work with completable future. There is, there is quite a lot of them. So if you want to find more information, um, the, the first two links are really worth looking at. So uh, it's the, the, the second one is actually the official documentation on the Kotlin language. And the first one contains some guides there are some starting guides and some in-depth um, you know, information about how coroutines work. So if you're interested, I suggest you have a look at it. It's really very clearly written, um, very interesting. And there's also a couple of KotlinCon videos where Roman Elizarov, which is the creator of the coroutines in Kotlin, uh, he, gave, uh, uh, he gave two talks about coroutines. So you can have uh, a look at them. It's, they are really, really very nice and very um, approachable. So yeah, that's about everything from me. I don't know if you have some, some time for questions. We have. OK. So questions?